lovely folks. Um, so I, I just want to start by saying I'm super excited to be here. Um, and I want to begin with a gratitude. Um, I want to start by just thanking the amazing organizers and femme dreamers of this event, Andy Schwartz and Sarah Redekop, for arranging this incredible conference. It's the first one I've ever been to that is femme centered. Um, and if we can, I would like to please invite us to give either an audible or digital round of applause to them and to all the moderators and folks who've organized and collaborated in creating this uh, conference. Thank you all so, so much. Thank you, thank you. Um, so here we go. I wanna just thank everyone for, for staying on. I'm coming to you from uh, 10 a.m., but I know a lot of y'all are in the afternoon. So thank you for joining me today in thought and conversation. I am talking to you all today from the unceded lands of the Tongva and Gabrielino people, the sovereign indigenous stewards of the Los Angeles Basin and the Channel Islands in California. I am sitting at my desk in my home office and for access, I'd like to give a brief um, image description. So I'm a light olive skinned femme with like a short pixie haircut. I'm wearing a black shirt, a black sweater and um, round navy paper flower earrings. Um, I'm wearing bright lipstick and I have lots of picture frames around me and my plant babies um, to the side with some sunflowers. My talk today is entitled Queer Interventions, Mad Femme Excess in Parts. I come to this work and this thinking around excess and feminists as a mad, disabled, queer femme of color. I come to this work as an educator and writer who has messy thought feelings. Thought feelings are the queer futures collective's language for reciprocal acknowledgements of how we think and how we feel. When I think about my own thought feelings, I think about the perfectionism and self-doubt that follow me in academia. I think too about the stories doubt forces me to leave out, the stories it tells me are delegitimate. I now know that these are precisely the stories I must tell. I want to make an offering to myself and to you lovely folks here today. I want to explore my femme identity and my madness by using a framework of mess. Mess, the generative, imperfect place of growth and potential. Mess has become my reminder to embrace vulnerability, especially when perfectionism overwhelms me, especially when it tells me later or tells me never. Dear humans, I have to be honest. My madness, my queer feminists, locate me in a cyclical place of distrust. I struggle with imposter experience in overwhelming excess. The first time I started to shift my thinking around self-doubt was when I heard the amazing writer and activist Sonia Renee Taylor share that in moments when she feels doubt approaching, she asks herself, what oppression is happening right now? Sonia's question reminds us of how oppression binds us, tethers us to violent norms and expectations, and moves us further and further away from how we understand ourselves. Mess intervenes in this restriction, in this body-mind restraint, by inviting us to imagine past the restrictive places oppression locates us. Although the realization that perhaps when we doubt ourselves, we carry anxiety and unease, the doubt is not coming from ourselves, but instead being ideologically placed on us feels so big and transformative that I haven't quite digested yet. Um, I'm really seeking to gift it to us today as remedy and as something for us to move toward. Truth. I originally wrote this keynote as if I was writing a scholarly essay, and what I ended up with was a disembodied talk. 
When I was originally reading my draft to my wife, she noted that I had left my story out of the narrative, something I often do in my drafts. She asked me, where are you? To this question, I realized that I had tidied my story. I had erased my own excess. In the spirit of manifesting mad femme practices, I would like to begin with an invitation for us. This invitation is informed by the work of Chicana feminist and educator Stephanie Cariaga, who writes about how in academia, the expectation is that we leave our body, mind, spirit needs at the door, or in this case, like the digital doors um, of electronic universities. She says that we leave the struggles, the difficulties, the caretaking, all of our responsibilities. The expectation is that we leave that behind before we enter into these academic spaces. As you folks listen today, look around your space and check in with your body, mind, spirit. What do you need today? What are you bringing here with you? Um, and one of the reasons I have to say that I ask for us to all be on the screen together is to kind of disrupt this idea and kind of be in community with one another. So what do you need today? What do you bring with you? Do you need to lay down or sit in a chair as you listen? Do you need to play with your fidget toy, which if you hear me clicking, that's what I have here. Do you need to color? Do you need to knit while you listen? Do you need to drink water? Do you need to get a snack? Do you need to listen with your camera on or off or a combination of both? I invite you all to explore and express your body, mind, spirit needs as they arise while we're gathered here together in this communal digital space. I'm hoping that today's conversation will move us toward a collective reimagining of what our communities and maybe academia can feel and look like. I'd like to introduce a brief quote to us by way of epigraph. And this quote is from Access-Centered Movement. Um, they are a trauma-informed, disability justice-informed group in the San Francisco Bay Area founded by queer, disabled people of color. As I read this, I invite you all to ground yourselves, um, to take deep breaths, perhaps plant your feet on the ground, Maybe close your eyes if you're comfortable. You are not too sick, too disabled, too sad, too crazy, too ugly, too fat, or too weird. We live in a white supremacist, patriarchal, ableist culture that values oppressive standards for the sake of centralizing power and making profit. Our ostracism is a result of this system that demonizes difference and not a reflection of your worth, value, ability to be loved. You are not the problem. You are perfect. Today's exploration of mad feminists is going to be messy and playful. It is going to be part narrative, part poem, part theory. It is settling firmly into my own border living, my own slip shifting identities that sometimes make me or make me feel too much. It is going to be an invocation of mad femme strategies for our collective grounding and sustainability. And as a way of practicing mad feminists and moving forward in this keynote, um, between the sections, I'm going to pause, I'm going to share my screen and offer you all a journal prompt that you can either engage with for three minutes or not and just rest, close your eyes, grab a snack, etc. Part one, Mad Femme Terrain. I enter in and out of discernibility as a mad person especially as a mad educator. I have learned the artificiality of the adage, madness is as madness looks. I am a mad border body, 
a body mind that continues to live within the borders of what we have culturally crafted as sanity and madness. And I am not alone in my border living. My fellow mad community and I live out of bounds in days of productivity and happiness that are edged up against days where our depression keeps us pinned to our beds. As mad border bodies, we live in a place of blending and negotiation. On most days, my moods do not invade my routine of teaching, mentoring, attending meetings, grading, and writing. On other days, however, sometimes even on the same day, I do these things while navigating anxiety, racing thoughts, depression, and the urge to self-harm. As a mad border body, my madness is not always visible. I dwell in between in a place of constant shifting that unhinges and destabilizes the categories of mad and sane. As an undergrad, after my first hospitalizations and before I found the right combination of mood stabilizers, antipsychotics, and antidepressants, I asked one of my English professors for a medical withdrawal. He wanted to know why. Back then, why became a difficult question for me to answer. When our body minds excessively spill over expectations, we search for answers and we are always forced to offer proof. My mind immediately crafted a list of reasons. Because my night meds make it incredibly difficult for me to wake up in the morning. Because the way you are looking at me now makes me feel insignificant. Because your inquiry suggests that you think I am lying. In that moment, these questions became vapor, these answers became vapor, and I could not name them. Instead, I cried, I spilled. I exceeded the permittable in that space, and in the unexpected shock of it all, he signed the paperwork. This is one of the stories I honestly deleted in my first draft. In fact, I used to and continue to self-censor and delete much of my story. I self-censor how I write. The same oppressive, colonial, cis-heteropatriarchal question haunts me. Is this academic enough? Is what I'm sharing with you academic enough? My mad femme praxis repositions me and invites me in. When, what in fact does it mean to be academic enough? How do we in our disabled, chronically ill, mad femme universes render academia messy, render it femme? As educators existing in a sanest academic culture, we are not supposed to have unruly minds. We are instead supposed to be balanced, energetic, collected, and calm. We are supposed to for perform as non-disabled, as sane for our own survival. If we do disclose our disabilities, our madness within the institution, then we find ourselves edging our body minds closer and closer towards substantial risk. We the mad have always been framed in excess. Social and biomedical imaginaries frame us as out of our mind. I have adopted the language of manic depression and anxiety to name the untidiness of my thoughts and moods, the cycling of it all. My mad mind, our mad minds exist beyond moderation. The medical industrial complex responds to our excess often with excess. When I went searching for definitions of excess in the Oxford English Dictionary, I was called to excess not as a noun, but more as a verb. The OED offered excess this way, quote, excess as adjective beyond the usual or specified amount, beyond what is necessary, proper, or right, 
end quote. I think here of the historicized forms of beyond necessary, proper, and right for the mad many, long-term institutionalization, lobotomies and bloodletting, state-supported abuses. I think of the excessive reduction of our body minds to pathology and clinical material. In this place, we are patronized and shamed. We reach out in vulnerability only to be silenced by medical professionals. We look for guidance, we slip, and the slippage can be violent, can mean erasure, can mean forgotten. If I were to time travel, to sit alongside myself in my professor's office and intervene as an empowered mad femme, I would say that I need a medical withdrawal because I refuse to let academia invalidate my needs. Because I struggle and I'm honest in my struggling. Because academia was not made for my brain, wasn't made for neurodiversity, wasn't made for crip time. I would look at this man who was more curious than compassionate, and I would say that I know that I am not discernible. In fact, as a mad person, I move in and out of discernibility. I do this knowing that we have socioculturally been conditioned to look for demarcations of proof for all of our invisible identities. We have, for example, collectively learned and been taught that the main signifier for disability is a white outline of a wheelchair user surrounded by a monotone shade of blue. If our disabilities are not visible and we do not share our status or access needs, we are often told we are faking it, that we are looking for attention, or we are being deceitful. We have to prove our access needs as valid with what the Social Security Office in the US calls evidentiary requirements, assessments and medical evidence, things that all assume financial accessibility and healthcare coverage. For queerness, we are taught that an asymmetrical haircut or rainbow pin demarcates. So many femmes, myself included, have only been contextually visible as queer when we're holding hands with our partners or when we name ourselves. In fact, using the word or the words, my girlfriend as a femme does not immediately speak to our queerness, neither does the word partner. As femme, I move further and further past discernibility into a place of unnaming. When I think about how femme slip shifts in expression and definition, I think about a question my dad asked me when I first came out. He recalled me as I was, as I sat next to him and declared, but you don't look gay. This statement is a misreading of femme as only and always feminine, as only and always heteronormative, as only and always subject to a male gaze. We as femmes know, however, that femme is messy. We know that it is precisely its mess that empowers us to free femme from its binary and reductive namings. We know that as disabled, mad, chronically ill femmes, our body minds become documentation, become proof. We all testify to the pitfalls of visibility. So I'd like to share my screen now and give us time for rest and to give us time to, if it feels right, respond to this question, where does femme take you? Um, and if you'd like to take a rest instead, please know you're invited and we'll take three minutes.
Okay, folks, welcome back. All right, so we're gonna move on to part two. I'm gonna pause for the ambulance. Part two, mad femme interventions. In my queer, disabled, mad femme of color community, we know that femme is a multi-directional love universe. For us, femme is intersectional, femme is collaborative and fractal. Femme exists in solidarity against femphobia and fatphobia. Fem exists in solidarity against cissexism and against the racism that femmes of color experience, against the colonizing oppressions that define femininity. Here, fem offers potential for play and for naming. Fem invites a space for me to inhabit that is at once mess and also messes with madness and queerness. These are my identities and they do not need to be tidied. I need to repeat this because this is what I most often forget. My identities do not need to be tidied. Tidiness can press and push against intersectionality, against the collective naming and honoring of all our parts. My understanding of femme explosion and unlearning came from the fierceness of the disabled femmes of color I love and look up to. Disability justice activist and ancestor Stacy Milburn names the community members who serve as our guides and our femme tours, especially around reframing what disability means as crip doulas. I playfully extend this to consider the many femme doulas who have taught me that we in our identities are resilience and strength. Here, I think of the wisdom sharing and doula ship of Vanessa Durand, Lilac Violet Maldonado, Jen Venegas, Leah Lakshmi Piepsna Samarasinha, and Patty Byrne. In this place, informed by these voices, Femme becomes a call for our collective survival. Femme becomes how we access and co-create transformational generative knowledge. Mad femme positionality does not assume, but rather asks us to consider. Do you have capacity today? What do you need? Femme empowers us to queer vulnerability and tenderness. And in this messy place of undoing, Femme creates opportunities to mess and to use mess to empower and shift Femme outside of the binaries of shame and excess to become instead liberatory tools. One moment in particular that stands out to me here um, makes me think a lot about how the metaphor of net mess has led me to consider where generative potentials can come from. And this moment took place in 2012. I had completed and emailed my first dissertation chapter to um, Alex Uhas, who is a feminist writer, filmmaker, member of my dissertation committee. We met at an Armenian bakery in Glendale in California, and what I had offered her was a very clean and tidied chapter, not just in regarding, um, not just in regards to the edits, but also in regards to structure and inquiry. She explored the text again as I sat and tried to gather the mess that was literally in front of me, the flakes of Boglebo that were clinging on my shirt, um, the crumbs that had gathered on the table in the corner of my mouth. Alex read and said the following, what you have created here is a beautiful cake. The flowers and the frosting are perfect. Nothing is out of place. What I want you to do now is add pepper on this cake. 
PEPA was my first indication of mess as intervention, mess as explosion, mess as probe. It was my first understanding too of how FEM can sever binaries, how FEM can render messy assumptions and expectations. It was my first understanding of how FEM could mean community and homecoming. With Pepper, with mess, FEM becomes communal reminders, becomes gentle urging toward what we need. I think here, for example, of my dear friend and colleague, Keelan Koning, who kept Alex's insistence of Pepper alive in my writing, unearthing it in times of great need. Mess became, just as Femme did here, opportunity for growth and transformation. I am going to share my screen again and invite us to take a pause. Uh, the question for consideration is, what is your FEM intervention? Welcome back. Part three, a mad femme love letter. Dear loves, dear disabled, mad, chronically ill femmes, dear loves who journey the world in every shade of exhaustion, tension, energy, excitement, and restedness. We need you. 
PTSD raging, disappearing only to appear again. Depression that feels like stones are weighing you down. We need you. Your body mind is radiant, iridescent worth. Sanism and ableism will try to make you forget, but please remember, leaving your bed is victory. Going to the bathroom and returning to your bed is victory. Remembering to drink water is victory. Sitting in the grass, laying on your back and reveling in joyous nothing is victory. Activism and community building is victory. And yes, binge watching Netflix to get through your sleepless nights, all victory. Dear disabled, mad, chronically ill femme, navigate the world as you need to. You deserve long showers and hours of coloring. You deserve boundaries, resilient and fluid and fiercely yours. You deserve a declaration of needs. Dear disabled, mad, chronically ill femme, you deserve. And a culture that tells you that a disability means damage, disaster, and stigma you deserve. You deserve access and honest content warnings, space to leave and space to return. You deserve fury, exhaustion, and rage against all the people who tell you to get over it and pull yourself together. You deserve fury, exhaustion, and rage against all the people who tell you that if you do yoga, eat certain foods and avoid others, drink orange juice or fill in the blank that you will be better. Dear love, remember that you are knowledge. You are archive. You are all the glitter this world has to offer. You are the smell of lavender. You are compass. You are the smile on the corner of your lips. We're going to take a brief three minute break. The prompt for consideration is what does femme communicate?
Welcome back. Section four, Mad Femme Offerings. Mad Femme politics messes with academia's sanism and femphobia with the supposed mandate that we as educators are not just supposed to be mentally collected, but we are also supposed to embrace a detached rigor in the classroom. We are not supposed to be tender, vulnerable, slow, or compassionate. The university operates in this linearity, and yet we, as mad femme educators, spill pass, we mess. Our needs become a most radiant compost growing us toward change. The purpose of this last section is to offer mad femme strategies for our collective resilience and survival, both within academia and beyond. These first two are informed by the knowledge production and activism of disability justice, a movement building framework that began in 2005 and that was led by disabled, gender non-conforming, transgender, queer folks of color who were exhausted and frustrated by the lack of intersectionality in the mainstream disability rights movement in the US. So the first offering is sustainability. Sustainability is the fifth principle of disability justice. Written by disability justice activists and led by Sins and Ballad, a performance project from the San Francisco Bay Area, sustainability states the following, quote, we learn to pace ourselves individually and collectively to be sustained long-term. We value the teachings of our bodies and experiences and use them as a critical guide and reference point to help us move away from urgency and into a deep, slow, transformative, unstoppable wave of justice and liberation." End quote. Advocating sustainability is a distinctly mad femme practice. It is a reframing of the classroom as a place where tenderness and vulnerability can coexist with our body, mind, spirit needs. Although this is something I practice, I have noticed that this offering in particular needs to be modeled. My understanding of the classroom, both as a learner and an educator, has been regulated by oppressive assumptions. Rigor is something that is limited to minimal to no absences, as completing our work on time every time, as holding our bodies still in our seats for the entirety of class. Rigor is not asking for or allowing extensions or, or alternative ways to participate in class. Rigor, I have noticed, is the exact opposite of equity. Once I disclose my disability, my madness in the classroom, I introduce my learners to sustainability and to a culture of care. Um, and I have to say too that I'd be more than happy to talk about the intersection of risk and privilege and disclosure during the Q&A. If my capacity was low, if I had brain fog, or if I was feeling overwhelmed with anxiety or depression, I shared with my learners and asked for a slower paced class and for understanding when I paused while speaking. Out of this growth, Learners who felt safe enough to share their body mind needs began speaking vulnerably and tenderly. One learner began a class by asking if the lights could be dimmed because she had a migraine. Another asked her peers to come to class wearing low scent products. And another asked if he could take a self-care day because his depression was overwhelming. Together, we transformed the classroom and centered access in ways that embrace negotiation and compassion. Here, we do not assume the worst of our learners and we incorporate their body, mind, spirit needs into what we do and how we do it. Together, we make the classroom and the act of learning messy. 
inquiries and check-ins about capacity are things I have learned from my mad disabled, chronically ill femme community of color. We discuss capacity or spoon check-ins as powerful interventions to the expectations of femme labor. Check-ins in the classroom also serve to hold the space. How is everyone doing? What resources do you need? Do we need to extend the due date? Does this still feel accessible? I invite you all to consider this. What would it look like to integrate and manifest principles of sustainability into your communities, your classrooms, into your friend networks? How can we apply our feminists into our own future making? How can we craft our futures using disabled, mad, chronically ill wisdom, even if we are not disabled? Offering number two, collective access. Sins and Valid defines collective access this way, quote, we create and explore ways of doing things that go beyond able-bodied neurotypical norms. Access needs aren't shameful. We all function differently depending on context and environment. We share responsibility for our access needs. We share that our needs can be met without compromising our integrity. We balance autonomy while being in community and we can be unafraid of our vulnerabilities, knowing our strengths are respected." End quote. To advocate for collective access is to also challenge the ableist, sanest beliefs that the mad, disabled, chronically ill are a liability, that we are burdensome, our body minds just too different, too demanding, too out of control. This principle celebrates our body-mind needs and removes them from a discourse of shame. We enter into this place and mess with the excessive. We shake, we erase, we renew. In its wake, we bring our own incantations, our own medicines. Three, decomposition. As a queer mad femme of color, I have learned that as femme songwriter and musician, Brian Juniper writes, quote, being femme is a process of unlearning the reasons to hold my tongue while being faced with the risk of speaking up, end quote. I apply the belief that femme is process and guidance to all of the body spirit lessons I have been taught and work to unlearn. I have, for example, unlearned that it is better to hide your disability rather than claim it with pride. I have unlearned that vulnerability and tenderness are inherently feminine and therefore signs of weakness. As tool and empowerment, my femme identity has helped me name my madness despite risk. How might femme move us toward unlearning? What might we, you unlearn, what do you need to unsettle? What do you need to decompose? I want to specify that I'm offering this word decompose with great intention. Um, this summer I began composting again and I noticed a potential um, metaphoric opening. So when I'm in the kitchen, I have this bucket and I'm gathering coffee grounds, eggshells, banana peels, greens. And at the end of a day or sometimes two, I take it into the backyard. In the heat of the yard, as I do this, I often lean in and watch as I empty the bucket. And I notice that the earth is moving and everything is decomposing. I notice a collage of mess, bacteria, heat, and moisture. I notice that this is the growth of mess, the potential for renewal, the glorious reimagining of waste as nutrient. I invite us to pull on this metaphor of decomposition and mess, to consider it as that which persists, as permission to play and reconsider. 
what can our femtors and crypt doulas and fem doulas help us repurpose? What new wisdoms can we grow? How can we transform waste into something fertile and new? For me, um, in California, fall semester began on Thursday. I am certain that on low spoon or capacity days, I will enter into a meeting or a classroom unsure about whether or not there'll be room for a mad femme politic. I may question, waver, and forget. I may get swallowed by the excessiveness of it all. Will tenderness and vulnerability be viewed as weaknesses? Will my sensitivity, care, and need for slowness and rest frame me as a less academically rigorous professor? Will naming and owning feminists and madness feel too formidable? How might this conversation shift as I go through my tenure track journey? As these questions arise while I write at my desk, I think of my femtors, my cryptulas, my femdulas, and I look at the pictures of them that surround my workplace, specifically to my, my left, your right. In response to these questions, their faces and their words tell me no. Mad femme politics can be grounding, powerful, and an incredible way to think and feel through the world. And so with their offering, I imagine. I imagine loving radical networks of disabled communities on all our university campuses. I imagine educators sharing spoons and resources and talking about cripping teaching so that it is accessible and sustainable for all our body, mind, spirits. I imagine that we say academia and safety together and mean it, imagining cohorts of learners earning their degrees without being overwhelmed mentally, emotionally, and physically by the sanism and ableism of their programs. I imagine a climate where we celebrate neurodiversity in our educators and in our learners. Access for us can become love and liberation, can become tenderness and consideration. As I sit with this growth, I wonder, perhaps access with its focus on collectivity and its urgency for strength and vulnerability, perhaps access has been femme all along. One more break, one more offering. The question is, what does your femme future look like?
Welcome back. So that's the end of the talk and um, an invitation to just have us enter into conversation with one another. And I mean, I think one way to do it also is if folks want to share what they wrote down during the breaks um, as launch off points for us to consider, for me to consider, that would be another exciting way in, but just lots of like love and gratitude and hearts um, for you all for sharing space with me and listening today.